Good morning, and welcome to the launch of the annual Lithuanian FinTech Landscape Report. My name is Gintaira Bocciliena. I am head of technology team at Invest Lithuania. I'd like to start today's event with a quote by Roy T. Bennett. Change may not always bring growth, but there is no growth without change. Today you will be the first to hear the key insights how Lithuanian fintech sector developed over the past year. At the end of 2019, we took a snapshot of the sector, we surveyed fintech companies in Lithuania, and we're very excited to share the insights with you. In just three short years, Lithuania has transformed from a fintech wannabe to a globally recognized magnet for fintechs, which is now in the top four locations in terms of attractiveness alongside with the US, UK, and Singapore. That's a great achievement. How did we do it? I think the secret recipe lies in having a clear focus and a vision and concerting the actions by the government, the regulator, and the industry. One of the institutions that's been instrumental in driving the development of fintech sector in Lithuania is, of course, Ministry of Finance. Therefore, now I'd like to invite Vilu Šopoka, Minister of Finance, to say a welcome word. Please welcome, Minister. Good morning, everyone, dear friends. I am pleased to welcome you to this uh, annual event where we all share our progress, achievements. A few, just a few years ago, I could have not Im imagined uh, how can we grow so fast. But as it was already mentioned, now we are number one in the European Union. Uh, I, of course, uh, thank you to our colleagues from the UK. Uh, whenever I travel abroad, I always uh, uh, being asked uh, how could you manage to be so fast. So, uh, of course, it's uh, our the key of our success is a unique cooperation between Minister of Finance, the Central Bank, Minister of economy and uh, innovations, uh, Invest Lithuania, and many others, and of course uh, market participants. So the strength is our cooperation. And uh, I would like to say thank you uh, to all of you because uh, uh, everyone who is now here uh, is uh, a very important uh, factor of our mutual success. What I would like to stress that I see the opportunity, another opportunity in uh, sustainable finance. Uh, as I say, sustainable or green finance is more about data and less about trees. Therefore, it's a great niche and I do believe that uh, we also can be successful uh, in this area as well. And finally, I, I'd like to stress that it's not a coincidence that uh, we gathered together on the St. Valentine's Day. Why? Uh, because we love FinTech. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, now I'd like to invite uh, the so-called godfather of FinTech in Lithuania, Marius Jurgilas board member of Bank of Lithuania, to say a welcome word. Thank you, Gintaria, and uh, welcome to the fintech community, and uh, we are very happy to have you. And uh, yes, I guess my, my job is to overview the 2019, actually without seeing the report, I didn't see the report, no one saw the report. Everyone is looking forward to see what the result is. But what do I remember from uh, uh, 2019? I remember that uh, International Monetary Fund called us and said, can you do a, a lecture? Uh, because we, we want to understand uh, how, how did you do that? Uh, World Bank called us and said, um, can you do a training session for our stuff. 
And uh, two days ago, I was uh, at the place where four years ago we went to see how it's done. And uh, Bank of Israel forced me to do a full day of uh, everything, trying to explain from a regulatory perspective, how do you interact with the Minister of Finance? How do you deal with, uh, with the Parliament? Because you know, we have issues with Knesset you know, politics. I said, we also have issues. And uh, you have to find solutions. And uh, I guess our strength is at finding solutions. And uh, what the result is, you just have to look at the room of people here from various institutions, various businesses. And to me, this is a measure of success. And uh, what is the impact to the broader society? It's not for me to judge, and uh, I guess it's uh, our consumers uh, receiving much broader services. And uh, as the minister just said, we also have to think about sustainability, and not only in the sense of uh, green or other type of uh, sustainable development goals, but sustainability from a financial risk perspective. Because if we do not deliver on that, next year we will not be number four. We might be number 14. But if we deliver, sky's the limit. So I'm very much looking forward to the results of our review. Thank you, Marius. People say that best things come in threes. So we could not miss the opportunity to have the third welcome speech by a very special guest uh, who is visiting Lithuania for the first time. <laughs> no, that's what I was told, but not the first time. Uh, but the first time on this occasion. Uh, so please welcome President and CEO of Swedbank, Jens Hendriksen. So uh, thank you very much. I don't know how many times I've been to Vilnius. Uh, this is my first time in my new position as the CEO of, of Swedbank. I love coming to Vilnius and it's just great. Uh, I started coming here, I think the first time was uh, 91 or something like that uh, and I'm sort of so development is just astonishing uh, I must say uh, I had a really bad day uh, um, um, and I woke up like four o'clock in the morning and, um, and we had uh, issues with our network and we've been down sort of all over in Sweden in Estonia Latvia and Lithuania so uh, but the key point is not I had a bad day the key point is that our customers had a bad day. Sort of uh, people who wanted to pay with their credit cards, people want to send direct payments, and we were not there uh, for them. And for that, I'm very sorry and I ask for apology. But that also says something how important uh, the things we do. Uh, when we have an issue like this, we affect people all over the world because they might be traveling using our cards and uh, uh, it's uh, top of the headlines. Therefore, um, I was a bit happier that the day went better and better, and if it's going the direction it's going right now, it's gonna end really good, because I had a good customer meeting, I had a good meeting with the Minister of Finance, and now uh, uh, I saw that the, the sort of web is, sort of the, the network is coming up, and then I stand here in front of you to talk about the Lithuanian fintech ecosystem interview overview. And I see it here with friends, partners, competitors, uh, uh, but most of all, I see sort of a, a spirit. Uh, and I'm extremely proud to be here standing in front of you and be one of, of the opening speaker uh, with sort of one of the leading fintech capitals in the world. Uh, good luck and I'm waiting to see uh, for the results. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Henriksen. So I think with all of that prep work, you're already very eager and excited to actually see what are the key findings and the key highlights of the Lithuanian fintech sector. So uh, the, the person who will do um, the, an overview of the key findings is a person who was actually the main driving force in preparing the report and has put enormous amount of time and effort 
um, in actually making it happen. So uh, please welcome my excellent colleague, Rogilia Stonite, Senior Investment Advisor at Invest Lithuania. Good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to see so many of you here today, our colleagues, our partners, our investors, and our talented local fintech ecosystem players. Lithuania's fintech ecosystem would have never went this far if not uh, for the hard work and collaboration of various ecosystem players and institutions. Thank you, Bank of Lithuania, Ministry of Economy and Innovation, Ministry of Finance, and many others who have helped to create this vibrant ecosystem that we have today that doesn't stop surprising the world for one day. Who is this little country making so much noise? So, as last year, this year again, um, it was a very interesting uh, task to count all the fintech companies that have been established in Lithuania, to contact them, to ask to fill the survey, and finally analyze the results. And without further hesitation, please download your new fintech landscape in Lithuania report. And if you like it, please share with others and help to spread the word about what we all are trying to build here. Uh, when you were entering the rocket, you must have uh, received the little cards with the QR codes. And if you haven't, please take one uh, before you're leaving, or if you have time, please scan it right now. So 2019 marked a significant milestone for fintech in Lithuania. In this year, uh, Lithuania received a very um, kind recognition by a indexable global fintech ranking, uh, nominating Lithuania number four fintech location um, uh, ac across the globe. Furthermore, Vilnius was recognized as number one city worldwide by attracting greenfield FDI tech projects, uh, outranking uh, cities like Berlin, Tel Aviv, Singapore, and even London. And we didn't stop there. Uh, Lithuania this year climbed several steps up in the global ease of, doing best, uh, ease of doing business ranking. And we are very happy that we are taking number 11th this year. So the, the numbers speak for themselves. And actually, they are continue to be very instrumental in spreading the word even further. So Within our team, we were holding this number about how many fintech companies there are established in Lithuania for quite a while now. And I must say I'm very happy and very relieved to be finally able to say it out loud that at the end of 2019, we have calculated there were 210 fintech companies established in Lithuania. The sector has grown by 24%, and we actually don't see a reason why this number should be stopping here, as at the moment we have more than 100 projects in our pipeline. As last year, this year, uh, fintech companies that are headquartered in Vilnius or in Lithuania take the largest share of the fintechs in Lithuania. However, it's important to know that this number does not only represent uh, fintechs established by Lithuanian entrepreneurs, but also those of um, other countries who found our investment environment more favorable than their own, or even non-EU uh, entrepreneurs who, with the help of Startup Visa, have relocated to Lithuania and began establishing their long dream fintech startup here in Lithuania. Um, so if looking um, uh, at the fintechs that are headquartered not in Lithuania, in other countries, uh, the number of them have grown by 50% this year. And among those that, ha that are quartered outside of um, Lithuania but within EU, a uh, majority of fintechs come from United Kingdom. And if looking at non-EU countries, a uh, majority of fintechs as last year again, again uh, are from United States. If looking at uh, the core business activities that uh, fintechs um, uh, engage in that are uh, established here in Lithuania, uh, again, by far, payments and remittances take the largest share of the sector. However, we see that other segments such as lending, digital banking, um, insure tech have been growing as well. In the segment named other, you would uh, be able to find fintech companies, companies that are mostly engaged in analytics, big data, 
uh, blockchain, um, assets management and personal finance. And the segment that has seen the largest drop this year, not surprisingly, was crypto. But in more detail about this, you will hear in the presentation of Rocket, our, our partners who helped us to create this report and do the survey, who will analyze and show actually who are uh, present in Lithuania at the moment. So with this new addition of fintech companies in Lithuania in 2019, we are very happy that a number of global, um, well-recognized fintech brands have decided, uh, have chosen Lithuania to set up their operations and began um, operating here. So companies like SumUp, Flywire, Factories, Sonect, Verse, they all came to Lithuania last year and we're very happy to welcome them to our ecosystem. Another statistic or vertical that we measure our success and the growth of FinTech Hub um, uh, by is the number of job places created by FinTechs in Lithuania. So we are very happy that last year the sector has grown by 31% and as of the end of 2019, uh, FinTech companies in Lithuania employ over 3,400 people. And it's important to know that this number doesn't even include several large local companies that perhaps have payment institution licenses, but fintech is only a tiny bit of their overall operations. So at the moment, average fintech company in Lithuania has 16 employees, and the average salaries that they pay well outperform majority of other industries. Um, when we were doing uh, the survey together with Rocket, we are very happy that this year even 102 companies provided answers to our questions, which gave us a great chance to analyze almost 50% of the market. And we were very happy to see that companies here hire, hire a variety of functions and people from various disciplines. And not surprisingly, of course, you can see majority of them hire IT, engineering, compliance, ML, uh, product management, and so on. Um, and of course, many of the fintech companies that are in Lithuania, they're still large, uh, rather small startups that perhaps just started operating, and perhaps they only have one or two people that have to um, perform various responsibilities and a lot, a lot of roles in one, so perhaps they were not able to mark uh, one of the choices in our provided discipline. However, when looking at the data from the companies that were established in Lithuania two years ago or one year ago, we noticed that it really takes about 12 months for the startups to really kick off operations and start building the teams. And we noticed that a lot of fintech companies that last year had one person, this year employ several. And finally, the greatest statistic is that 97% of the respondents to our survey indicated that they are planning to expand their teams in Lithuania over the next year. A lot of, of the fintech companies that we have in Lithuania would not have come here if not for Bank of Lithuania, our regulator, who keeps looking straight into the eye of the innovation and brings Lithuania to the future of financial services. Um, we are very happy that second year in a row, Lithuania is uh, number two jurisdiction in European Union by the number of electronic money institutions and payment institutions issued here. But this is the total number as of the end of 2019. They weren't that quick to issue that in one year. But it really, the, the smooth and quick licensing processes that Bank of Lithuania is able to undertake very well outperforms majority of other jurisdictions. Furthermore, um, you must all be aware of Centralink, which is a payment system run by our regulator, Bank of Lithuania, which allows electronic money institutions and payment institutions which are licensed in European economic area to access SEPA payments. So this year, they, they reached very incredible results, results, I must say. So by the end of 2019, there were 85 institutions connected to this system and their total value of transactions amounted to almost 45 billion euros. So we are very excited to see um, the other initiatives that Bank of Lithuania is doing to come to the final stages in 2020, like LB Coin, LB Chain, and many others. 
Um, looking more broadly at our ecosystem, there are several trends that we expect. We notice perhaps they're not very surprising, but um, because you all are very much engaged in the ecosystem and you can expect as well what is happening. So definitely we see a further sector growth both by the number of fintech companies and by the number of job places created here. Furthermore, we are expecting and actually hoping that um, changes and, and open banking will foster growth of new and perhaps not yet popular business models in Lithuania, such as personal finance. In regards to the talent pool, we definitely see a rising demand for compliance and ML specialists, but at the same time, we are very happy to see that universities are actually uh, replying to this rising demand by introducing new courses that will cover fintech and compliance related studies. And finally, we also see that increasingly larger amount of international talents are discovering career opportunities in Lithuania. Um, and thanks to the initiative run by Invest Lithuania, which is called Work in Lithuania, also start of visa procedure, quite a number of international fintech professionals have relocated to Lithuania and joined our ecosystem. And in regards to infrastructure, we definitely see a rising interest from international venture capital firms and also accelerators to our ecosystem, so we're hoping more of them will join our ecosystem as well. And furthermore, several institutions at the moment are um, organizing um, some initiatives to further raise Lithuania's fintech excellence. So we're very much looking forward to see that coming live in 2020. So thank you all, uh, very much for, for your attention. Uh, the data that you've seen here, the insights that you've seen here, you can further read and analyze once you download our report. And as from Invest Lithuania, um, for 2020, we have very ambitious plans. We will not stop helping international companies to discover business opportunities in Lithuania. We will continue spreading the word our fintech hub around the globe and hopefully we'll bring some more exciting new brands home. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rugile. As you know, Rocket is the most buzzing, the most welcoming, and the most proactive fintech hub in Vilnius. We're very glad that we partnered uh, with Rocket for the production of the report. And I would like to invite Sharunas Malakite, head of Rocket Vilnius, to continue the, the, the highlights from the report with a focus on fintech community in Lithuania. Please welcome Sharuna. Hello everyone. So it's really wonderful feeling to welcome you at our home where we run FinTech Innovations daily and we try to build this community around the name Rocket which, with a high ambition to make innovations, to grow them and, and bring them to the world. Uh, from what uh, Rugila already briefed us, uh, it seems we are doing pretty, pretty well, but I'm here to talk more about community activities in Lithuania. So when this report started three years ago, uh, we had a goal to count the companies and basically to see what the numbers are we talking about. Because at that time, everybody was talking fintech, but nobody had a clear answer. So what are we talking about? With this report developing, we see a high increase in interest from the community members and having a service filled by around 49% of all the companies here in-house um, shows that uh, we are doing a great job in getting more and more uh, community feedback from all of you. As Rocket, we try to build the neutral ground for various levels of ecosystem players. And uh, from the audience today, we have government representatives, we have banks, we have fintechs, we have companies for fintechs that help to build their products. Um, and uh, this is a one big family that's, um, as Vilu Shopoka said, is celebrating the love of fintech today. So uh, let's move to... Uh, our yearly fintech map. So this is also the initiative that comes together with the fintech report yearly and uh, for the third time we are mapping all the companies that are existing in Lithuania. So this magical number 210 uh, will be in your heads and minds uh, at least for a year of half a year till we um, update this uh, 
map. And uh, in case you don't find your company or you know the ones that's missing, uh, please get back to us and uh, we are happy to update it. We realize that there is no one golden source for Lithuania fin uh, Lithuanian fintech companies, so we had to create one. So uh, from the map, uh, we can recognize a couple of uh, local front runners, uh, are part of the ones mentioned before in Rugila's presentation. Um, so Fininbox, Manobank, uh, that will be here with us today on the panel discussion, Profitus, Andato, uh, FinB lending platform, Neo Finance, SME Finance, Moku, Savvy, and Pesera. So if we look deeper into what are the core business activities in Lithuania, we would find those uh, segments but also with this year's report we realized that we really need a definition so what is Lithuanian fintech and uh, how do we count those companies down so we realized that for fintech organization first of all needs to be if we talk about Lithuanian fintech needs to be registered in Lithuania operating here and having uh, at least a single person running a business also it is organization that undertakes activities related to innovative business models technology that enables the disruption of financial services so as we can see no surprise that payments and remittances is, uh, is the leading category of all uh, also financial software uh, is uh, catching up and uh, for the first year we tried to differentiate because previously financial software was um, in the middle of all the other companies but didn't have its category on its own. As well lending, um, corporate, private, um, SME lending uh, all counted as one and makes 11% of Lithuanian market. Uh, talking about crypto, uh, it goes uh, together with blockchain and takes 6% of the market. Um, coming back to the survey, so uh, this is how many companies uh, filled our survey and we want to share a couple of findings that were very insightful about uh, our ecosystem. So we take this number as a whole, as mentioned, 49% of all the companies, fintech companies in Lithuania have um, answered. And uh, they represent companies in different sizes, from one person up to 200 and plus. Also, they are local and international businesses. Uh, they do license and non-license activities. Um, as well, they represent various key sectors, especially from the categories that are most dominant in the market. So uh, we go deeper and we see the business models and uh, what our fintechs are actually working on. So the majority, 40%, still tries to cover both for B2B and B2C sectors. 11% um, for B2B to C. Uh, on the left, right side, on your side, uh, we have pure B2B and pure B2C. Um, that's also catching up. Um, B2B is just number uh, has 4% uh, and other 5% of the market. What are the target markets for Lithuanian fintechs? So our uh, questionnaire findings show that Europe is total dominant for 99% of uh, fintechs in Lithuania, that means international and uh, locally created. Um, as well, 23% express their interest into uh, North America, Asia Pacific 24%, and these are the top three. Uh, we see shifting trends. Looking at this map, uh, currently there is more interest comparing to last year to European market and uh, decreased interest to Asia and North America. Why so? Uh, we see that... Uh, Fintech globally is growing and more and more interest from uh, various uh, companies and counterparties and uh, European fintechs have a real challenge. How to get into foreign markets when there are local startups that are growing, that are becoming unicorns um, and uh, we need to stand the competition. For two years in a row we asked this question, so how do you see your partnership with financial institution? For many there is still um, a rule that the uh, bank should be as a distribution channel, as a partner. Uh, also, bank as a customer uh, takes number two, but we see a shifting trend towards being very dependent uh, from the banks, uh, working and partnering with them, piloting their solutions, to working more independently. So if we look at the data from 2018, so basically bank as a customer was perceived for, from 51% of the companies, now it's only 35. And, uh, 
we are happy at the same time that some of the fintechs become competitors to banks on their own. This is stage of funding and uh, we can look um, how do companies survive in Lithuania. So uh, proudly not 38% of the companies are mature enough uh, to survive from their own revenue streams. Uh, in Lithuania 30% of the companies are bootstrapped, basically live from their own investments, family and friends. Um, the others uh, receive seed, pre-seed, uh, Series A, B or C investments. And uh, right now uh, ICO investments take um, only 3% to decrease from last year. If we look what companies are aiming to raise in the upcoming years, uh, we have a couple of numbers. We know that startups uh, don't go with high ambition and, um, and future plans, business models. Uh, so over 20% 20, 20 of the companies want to raise from one to five million in the next funding round. 18% uh, of the companies uh, want to raise five million and more. 16% of the companies will raise up to one million. So we know that revenue growth, and this is how some kind of we measure the success of Lithuanian fintechs is also increasing in Lithuania. So expected global revenue uh, growth in 2020. By 19 companies, they plan to increase it by from 100 to, uh, to 300%. 12 uh, will triple down. Uh, but 35% uh, of the companies at Lithuania currently are pre-revenue or no revenue at all. And uh, there is one organic reason. Uh, international companies especially uh, move to Lithuania for uh, research and development, IT development, compliance, IML, uh, but uh, sales and business development come after. Also many companies in Lithuania included in this map are operating for the first year. Let's talk about key challenges. Uh, so we asked our survey uh, participants, so what challenges did you see in 2019 and what challenges do you expect in the upcoming year? So in 2019, core things was, uh, were product development uh, and IT development, regulatory compliance that goes together with PSD2 uh, and customer adoption. It doesn't change much in 2020. A customer adoption and product IT development remains in the lead, but international expansion for many companies comes in the first place. When we talk about key opportunities for 2020, after hearing today's uh, welcoming speeches, I would add one more, so that would be sustainable finance. Um, but this is the view from the fintech angle. So open banking, instant payments, personal finance, digital currencies, as well as Rectech uh, should be the leading topics uh, in the upcoming year. Let's talk about diversity and inclusion. For the first time in our research, we added this uh, topic and we wanted to see what's the gender diversity and uh, multinationality of the companies in Lithuania. So we're proud that Lithuania is the first in the EU for share of women working in the high tech sector. When it goes to fintechs, 51% uh, of the companies we um, asked have one or more female executives in LT in Lithuania. But basically, sometimes this 51% makes from 0 to 30% of the companies uh, regarding the female ratio in their teams. So we have right now 40% of Lithuanian fintech companies that don't have or have very small number of, uh, of women in their teams. But uh, something to be proud about, uh, 39 companies right now in Lithuania are multinational in their teams in Lithuania. We are here to support your growth and uh, these are the great people behind the community activities, various initiatives. So we have government organizations and agencies like Invest Lithuania, Our Neighbors Go Vilnius, Mita Startup Lithuania. In Lithuania, two uh, fintech associations are existing and pretty active, um, going into direct meetings with startups, helping them, them out on a daily basis. So this is Fintech uh, Lithuania by Infobalt and uh, Fintech Hub uh, LT. There is a bunch of ecosystem facilitators and um, if you don't know where to go, these would be the ones to start with. Um, so as you can see and, and stay here today, and actually that was the closing day of the first FinTech uh, Accelerator program in Lithuania, Startup Wise Guys, that uh, has its graduation day on Tuesday. So that shows the development of new programs, of new supportive initiatives, and the further growth of uh, your FinTech company. Also now Lithuania is top four in the world uh, for developing FinTechs in the country. 
I hope you learned something new today. So let's connect. And I would like to thank my team who really contributed for making this report um, happen and keeps developing FinTech community on a daily basis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sharuna. So as you've seen, Lithuania is a perfect example that government can be a catalyst for fintech innovation. If it, continue, if it can continue to be that catalyst, if there are any challenges, if there are any opportunities for us to be even better, we hope that we'll find out in the following panel discussion, which will be moderated by Marius Jurgilas. Please welcome to the stage our panelists. Marius Kordis, Vice Minister of Economy and Innovation. Sigita Smitkus, advisor to the President of the Republic of Lithuania. Algimantas Rimkunas, advisor to the Minister of Finance. And Mindaugas Petrauskas, Deputy Director of the Financial Crime Investigation Service. Thank you, Gedra. So, I, I would like to say ladies and gentlemen, but I have to say it just gentlemen. I, I, and I guess that is just to counter, you know, and to restore the gender balance. Uh, we might have, you know, as we have so many women in the FinTech community. <laughs> yes, but uh, to get serious, so on this panel, uh, as was just announced, we have uh, who is who in uh, institutional financial technology sector, Ministry of uh, Innovation and Economy, the highest level representation uh, from the President's office, uh, the special advisor on fintech issues and foreign affairs in European Union, Sigitas, uh, the leader on financial technology at the Ministry of Finance, Algimantas, uh, and uh, the voice of reason from our FIU, Mindaugas Petrauskas. And uh, my job is to be as provocative uh, as I can. And I guess my first question would be to Sigitas. Sigite, as you remember, you know, four or five years ago, uh, we sit down and say, let's do it. What would you say is the next challenge? And uh, how would uh, you put that in front of the audience and uh, in front of a sector and in front of institutions. What needs to be done to cement our achievements and uh, maybe to, to think of new ones? Uh, how do you see that? Uh, and I guess you will have to speak now in your current capacity as representative of the president. Thank you, Marius. And of course, it's, uh, it's a great to be part of the tradition, tradition uh, which uh, cement uh, cements us and, uh, uh, and encourages uh, to think about the future. Uh, talking about, uh, about pillars where we can go together, um, of course, uh, sustainable finance. Now is, is very um, uh, hot uh, topic uh, for everyone. Uh, then uh, risk management risk management, and I, I do believe uh, that uh, this theme uh, could be, could be um, very promising for Lithuania. And um, I remember uh, my president uh, at FinTech in conference mentioned that uh, Lithuania has a very solid ground to be center of excellence for risk management, in, uh, not only in the European Union, but uh, but in the world, having everything for, for this, having a uh, very vibrant uh, uh, fintech community, uh, many uh, compliance officers, um, good uh, regulator, um, forward-looking uh, uh, policy makers and institutions. Um, and of course, uh, uh, today uh, our president is in Munich uh, uh, meeting uh, not only automotive uh, uh, industry uh, representatives, uh, but also investment funds uh, uh, people, also uh, people dealing uh, with FinTech, and also uh, talking about uh, wealth tech, about uh, 
about uh, our success, how we have managed to create one of the best uh, jurisdiction, jurisdictions for financial services in general. Thank you, Sagite. And uh, Mario, the question for you will be on doing business, so you can start thinking about the answer. And why doing business? This is another achievement uh, for Lithuania, and I'll delegate to Vice Minister to tell us what the achievement is, because the first question we get whenever we talk to constituency about the fintech, about finance, is what is, what is the impact? Why does it matter? And, um, you know, it, it is the case that finance is the juice of the economy that, you know, that makes everything go. And uh, can you, Mario, tell us uh, how the rankings in doing business, uh, do they reflect our achievements uh, in uh, fintech? or broadly more speaking in finance. And where would you see uh, the next steps besides you know, energy, uh, accessibility, and other things that we can improve in Lithuania or you know, lead the region uh, to push our rankings even higher? Of course, we're not doing it for just for the rankings because you know, what's the point? But you know, if, uh, if finance is not serving uh, our business, I guess there's no need. Regarding the doing business, of course, we are very happy about achievements that actually next year I am sure we will move upwards because we implemented a major insolvency reform and I think my colleagues at the, from the Ministry of Finance and former colleague at the Ministry of Finance, Sigitas, worked a lot on that. So we will be higher. But I think what's the most important thing is not to be probably number five or so, I will be very worried when we reach top five, because then what will be next? The most important thing about doing business is thinking, constant thinking what we could improve in our regulatory environment in general in order to stay there. This is not about number. This is about thinking how to move forward. And of course it helps. It helps to see that we are number 11. It will help to see that we will be in, in top 10 next year, hopefully, for everyone, because then it basically catches your attention, and then you start looking at Lithuania, what is happening there, and what we could do there. What's next? What we keep hearing from the business community. I'm from the Ministry of Economy. And every time when we meet business representatives, at the moment, the hottest topic is financing. How to get financing, where to get it from. From my personal perspective, it's also about investments. I can say honestly, you know, maybe I won't be too diplomatic, but since you're provoking me, for my personal investments, I'm using a British robo-advisor, because it's cheaper. And when I looked at all the sectors there, I didn't see wealth tech companies here. I would like to see them here. So just some initial thoughts. Yes, thank you, Mario. Very good that you brought up the subject of insolvency. And I can immediately link it to the you know, access to credit, because if if it used to be that on average it takes one year to get your money back once you have a, a claim and everything is in your, in, in your favor, the law uh, and everything, but still you don't get the money, then maybe it is understandable why our creditors you know, are so reluctant to lend to small and medium enterprises. And that's why last year we saw an uptick of one-third of denials on access to credit to small and medium enterprises in Lithuania. And I'm very happy to have a very high-level representative from one of the biggest banks in Lithuania here and there, uh, because the credit limit decisions are being made on this side of the room, not in that one. Um, and we are very looking forward to that. Uh, that would reflect the economic potential in, in Lithuania. But everything also needs to be done on our side. And now I'm switching gears uh, to a bit broader con context on, on issues because not exactly everything uh, can be led, initiated, and implemented uh, at, the, you know, 
at the government level or the, the president's office level, we are still part of this broader community called European Union. And uh, uh, I'm sure that the Minister of Finance has been f clearly following uh, the, the representations uh, on the initiatives at the European level on all these things that we are now talking about, alternative access to finance uh, and the new initiative of the newly elected European Commission to review the, the FinTech Action Plan. How can we be part of that and where are our strengths and what should we do for the next year? Uh, thank you, Maris, for your question, but I would like to start uh, with uh, my introduction that you did. So uh, I'm really are now again at the Ministry of Finance, uh, which I rejoined three, four months ago, and I have very interesting personal experience in that respect. Uh, when I was leaving Ministry of Finance uh, in autumn 2016, I remember the first meeting of FinTech Working Group on 29th of July. We were at the very embryonic stage of uh, all um, matters in, in FinTech. And uh, after returning from Sweden, uh, where I, I spent uh, almost three years in diplomatic service, uh, uh, now I see tremendous, uh, amazing progress in, in Lithuania in FinTech area. Of course, uh, Lithuania, as uh, all uh, other EU member states, are, are basing their policies on those uh, uh, regulations and directives that are commonly produced in Brussels, in, in European Commission, and we, uh, our experts are contributing to that, also working uh, in, in, in working groups, and uh, implementation uh, and or uh, uh, transposition of those uh, documents in the national legislation is, is very, very important. But on the other hand, uh, Lithuania being the number four globally and uh, the first or the second in the European Union, very often uh, can uh, advice, I think, uh, even uh, European institutions uh, on the most promising and the most uh, efficient uh, directions that we all should move. And speaking about the current composition of the uh, European Commission and especially the, the new heads of the European Commission, we know that uh, green deal is on the top or one of the top of the agenda and we uh, really and my minister just mentioned here that we see really big possibilities for synergy between uh, fintech instruments blockchain instruments on one hand and uh, green financing uh, green investment again we just came back from our visit in stockholm and uh, had several very interesting meetings and one of the most memorable was in stockholm uh, green Digital Finance Center, and we learned a lot uh, about the possibilities to join fintech instruments, blockchain instruments with green fields, and not only with green fields. So we, we learned ourselves that fintech is a universal instrument which could be very efficiently applied to many, many areas. Yes, I guess we are living in very interesting times where you know, people are really looking forward not to the new glamorous issuance of uh, shoes, but are happy to buy used stuff. And, you know, because it's pre-loved. Yes. Yeah. And uh, here I would like to divert to the audience and maybe ask in the context of what uh, uh, has been mentioned, how many of you know what the Fair Adjustment Fund is about? Raise your hand if you ever heard such a phrase, Fair Adjustment Fund. A person working on uh, Brussels issues, I see. Uh, a journalist. And all of the ecosystem, which is in desperate need of funding, have never heard about that. Where have we failed? Before you answer, before you answer, Fair Adjustment Fund is an initiative of European Commission saying, okay, if we go green, 
just, Marius, just transition fund, just. not fair. Just, oh, just transition fund. Big difference. Fund. It's not fair, it's just. <laughs> <laughs> but it's an initiative of the European Commission saying, if we're going to push all the coal-burning factories in Poland to close, we need to give something in return. And here's ridiculous amount of money that will be distributed. How are you going to be participating in that? Can I add uh, a few words? Uh, um, we're not talking only about just transition fund, about 7.5 billion euros. We're talking about 52 billion euros for Horizon program. And uh, probably uh, you should know that uh, everyone can apply for those money. And uh, for example, uh, for digitalization, climate change, uh, European Union could, uh, could provide us with more than 15 billion euros. So uh, for example, agriculture, 10 billion euros. And we are talking about money for innovations. So uh, my message to uh, FinTech uh, ecosystem is to look at possibilities to participate in bigger programs, to find your partners in other uh, EU member states and compete, uh, com to be brave and compete uh, for those uh, money. Because uh, this uh, commission um, has very ambitious EU strategic agenda, not, in, not only in climate change, but also in the fields of competitiveness. And you might be wondering why we have uh, Mindugas with us, you know, while we're talking about the EU funds. And uh, Mindugas job is to ensure that uh, whenever those funds are being used, they're not being abused for bad things. And uh, as well as FinTech can be an enabling factor where you need to certify a particular loan as green, as sustainable, and you know, there are multiple business opportunities where I guess that's why you are here, is also our job to ensure that those funds are really serving uh, those initiatives. And here, maybe you can uh, tell us about uh, the vigilance and uh, the initiatives that we will be taking to ensure that we do not fall in the difficulties that we had with uh, previous uh, uh, initiatives uh, on European funding. This one is working, okay. Uh, thank you, Marius. And uh, as I was already introduced, I'm representing uh, Financial Crime Investigation Service, who we are. Actually, we are protecting, in few words, uh, state budget, EU budget, and the uh, financial system of Lithuania, or part of EU or world. And uh, speaking about this event, actually, it's not the first time I'm here, but uh, it's first time I'm, I got invitation to such kind of event. And the first impression was when I got it from Rugile that uh, is it uh, invitation for fox to chicken house or is it uh, for chicken to fox house? You know? <laughs> yeah, but uh, it looks like, uh, you know, it's Friday, it's St. Valentine Day and we have really good atmosphere here. We're friends speaking about EU funds. Uh, Actually, we're not only supervisors or not only uh, uh, looking for abusing of that. Actually, we are part of that as well. Uh, we have one project uh, uh, within Horizon uh, where we're making some, like it's provision as well, where we were applying for uh, Krypton and et cetera, et cetera. Actually, we're, as a service, we're using uh, our IT specialist where we're looking for Big, big data analysis, we're looking for safer transactions and uh, we're using probably as all of you the system like, like SWOT, like uh, strengths, uh, weakness, opportunities and, uh, and threats. Why not to use that? And uh, as it was already mentioned that uh, we should be act active and uh, as a service for law enforcement, we're not uh, against or 
we're not uh, in, in uh, always we're looking for opportunities and for, for possibilities shortly like that. Yes, but in the way, we also must acknowledge that it's not only the EU funds that you are guarding, you're also guarding a, another a very important aspect of the financial sector, which is ensuring that it's not being used for money laundering or terrorism financing. And linking to what has been said already on the panel, uh, we had some issues in Europe, broadly speaking, and that's not focus on us also. Uh, in Netherlands, in UK, in the Baltics, in Sweden, everywhere these issues are abound, and really are taking the attention of the policymakers. And European Commission uh, has identified that we need to strengthen that area in Europe. Um, and many countries have implemented various ways of how they institutionalize that risk management. You know, we have an, an FIU. Uh, in Italy, the FIU function is at the central bank. I'm not saying I want another function on my head. But the European Commission said we need to somehow combine everything into one maybe place. And uh, let's challenge ourselves. Would you see Lithuania becoming a place where we lead the, the risk management of that type of risks uh, in European Union? Or we're not ready? Of course, actually, it was already uh, showed on, on presentations that uh, our financial system is uh, raising. And uh, if I remember right, uh, in 2018, like 13 billion of euros were in transactions. And uh, last year, it's already 45. It means more possibilities, more, more transactions, more uh, possibilities for threats. And of course, uh, we need to think how to improve job not only like country by country, it, it should be like I think uh, the uh, idea of region or EU or worldwide and uh, it's not possible to be warrior in this field only uh, one warrior in the field, you know. Actually, you know probably and, and we have some initiatives and together with Bank of Lithuania and with some private partnership and uh, we see uh, what doing our neighbors like Latvia, I don't know, Sweden, we're part of Europol and et cetera. Actually, we're looking and we have some initiatives and uh, one of the initiative is uh, Center of Excellence and I think we will, on this year, we will continue to work on that. Yes, uh, if I may, Marius, uh, I would like to add a few words. Uh, uh, in 2016, intellectually, we were uh, two, three years ahead of our main competitors. Intellectually, uh, talking about fintech, about uh, about uh, probably uh, issues related to risk management and so on. In 2018, the gap uh, narrowed, and it's narrowing. And we need to find new niches for our activities. I, and I do believe, I do believe that uh, risk management could be one of, one of the uh, areas where we could, um, could um, find uh, our way um, uh, for everyone, for, um, uh, for fintechs, for for financial institutions, for programmers, also for um, for our mm, our public institutions as well. I think that uh, risk management is a good uh, good uh, topic to discuss. I'll ask the last question to the panel, and you will start thinking of the questions that you would like to ask uh, the panelists. And my last question is actually to Marius. I've heard there is a rumor going on that Lithuania needs to become. A uh, real-time economy leader and uh, I guess that is connotation to the financial innovations that you know all of a sudden we can settle payments in real time uh, you know instant payments that the European Union is pushing for uh, Euro pan European initiative on instant payments and uh, I guess that also has to somehow be reflected in the business processes uh, or legislation that would enable uh, completely new business models to be implemented in, in, in at least in Lithuania. That's that's my focus. So, Mario, okay, can you maybe 
give us some guidance or some hope uh, on how this will be reflected in, in business processes? It's a very good and at the same time difficult question. But in general, we are thinking what we could do to increase our structural growth, if I could say so. The growth of our economy. So one way to go is to change the structure of our economy, and this is what's happening, for instance, in the financial sector in Lithuania. But at the same time, if we manage to use all the IT technologies, digitalization processes, and what is happening all over the world at the moment, there is another way how to go, to make our economy move faster. And it could be applied, this principle, in every part of our economy. If you want to build this building, for instance, you can do it in two years, or with all the permits, uh, land-related issues, and so on, we could manage to do it much faster. And this principle with digitalization could be applied in all the sectors of the economy. So this is the thinking that we are having at the moment under our roof, under our ministry. The question is which areas to choose to implement some pilot projects and where to start. All right. So anyone willing to express uh, their compliments on this day of love to the panelists now are now welcome to, to do them or, you know, to do it in a more subtle way and uh, wrap it in a question. Anyone is willing to Marius, do that? if I could intervene. Reagan once said that the worst sentences or words are I am from the government and I'm here to help. <laughs> so imagine I'm a supervisor and I'm a financial intelligence officer knocks on your door and says, I'm here to help. <laughs> so it's also important not to disturb the market. We have a question. Uh, lady in white. Finally, we got one thank you. have an answer, but I delegate it to the panelists. Maybe I, I, I provide just a part of the answer, my understanding. Uh, I think that uh, it should be in the interest of the banks themselves, actually, not to stay uh, as being classical, calm banks, because uh, the world is moving very fast. FinTech is, 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 is uh, really uh, showing results, uh, efficiency, uh, reach out of, uh, and, and many other things. I think it should be more in the interest of the banks than the government. Uh, this is, this is my, my answer. In, in more concrete uh, terms, uh, Payment Services Directive 2 requires banks to be transparent and open. We are talking about open banking. The leader of open banking in Swedbank is sitting in front of you. You can have a chat and they can tell you how they will enable and connect you to all the open data that they have. And we are where? In Rocket. Who would have thought five years ago that Rocket will be owned by Swedbank? <laughs> Any more questions? With that high note, uh, Thank you very much, uh, the distinguished panelists, and uh, I pass the word to our hosts, and uh, let's have a round of applause. Thank you very much. I think it was um, really inspiring to see you know the people from all of the relevant institutions actually discussing how we can 
continue developing fintech sector in Lithuania. Um, I would like to continue with the next panel, um, the last panel for today, where we will hear from uh, the industry, from the fintechs themselves, and we want to focus on the key challenges and the key opportunities that they see. Uh, I'd like to change the slide and also invite our panelists. So, um, first of all, Ruslanas Salnovas, CEO at Mano Bank. Then we have Johannes uh, Kolbinson, co-founder and CEO of Bastra. Sigurta Kuncevicute, CEO at Summit PU Payments. And Agne Selamonite, deputy CEO at Connect Pay. It's not that we couldn't find another moderator, but uh, I thought it would be just more efficient if I do the moderation of the panel as well. So, um, as, you, uh, as you all seen, uh, it was an interesting shift in terms of the fintech's responses. What were the key challenges that they foresee in 2020 compared to 2019? And in preparation uh, for the panel, uh, the, the, the panel uh, participants were actually quite uh, surprised that uh, RecTech and compliance was not among the top three. So... Um, Perhaps I will do a quick poll, also just to engage all of you at the back as well. Uh, in terms of the fintechs that are in the room today, do you think that regulatory compliance is one of the top three challenges that you will foresee in 2020? Please raise your hand. Okay, so uh, probably that's a fair presentation, but I'll, I'll, I'll throw this question to our panelists as well. So we can start. What is your thought on that? Well, um I had a thought that probably these companies were not investigated yet. And because um, thinking about the fintech in general and the financial uh, innovation and everything what's happening, uh, it's not about the regulator that is innovative, must be innovative enough, but the companies and because the people or the companies who, who use the payments, they are most innovative. So I think with regulation, with compliance, it's always the first thing that is supposed to be in fintech sector. So for me, it's like a, a no-brainer, and it's in what concerns our company as well. It's a, in our strategy this year, it's the top first priority to meet like the zero, like tolerant to non-compliance, and and make it the first thing in the in our investments as well. Yeah, I was a little bit surprised as well. <laughs> Compliance is my background. I, I'm used to talk about this topic like for years on different stages and now <laughs> it's not under the key challenges anymore. But I guess after thinking a couple of days about these results of a survey, I think um, the ecosystem is changing a little bit as well. Uh, let's say a couple of years ago, to find an experienced compliance officer within the market, I mean experience in fintech, it was mission impossible. Now it's a very difficult mission. Uh, I'm not saying it's an easy catch to find these kind of people in the market, but it's already doable. Also in terms of service providers, so in other words, uh, companies that can b help you to build a regulatory compliance program, there are much more now. Uh, there are also IT tools available. So I guess ecosystem is changing a little bit as well. And this uh, talking uh, about compliance and how important it is, uh, switch the results a little bit and the companies do understand as you said like we must be compliant we are not selling socks this is financial business and it's regulated it's heavily regulated and it will remain heavily regulated in the future so i guess that's my thoughts um, <clears throat> i um, also well i'm surprised a little bit and i actually disagree with this uh, result uh, i think that compliance is actually uh, probably the the most uh, the, the biggest challenge and uh, the biggest uh, burden for fintechs. Uh, all the AML, GDPR, PSD, uh, SCA, and what's coming up uh, for a fintech that's according to the PSD is able to get a license for with 125,000 uh, euros in equity. You have to spend much, many times this amount just to be compliant. So it's kind of uh, contradicting. And it's also, um, 
we see it on the market, uh, it takes three to five weeks to get a bank account, or even longer, two to three months, especially for companies. So, uh, and that's due to due diligence, KYC, AML. So this is really causing a pain to the, to the whole market. So, yeah. Well, maybe it's timely that we all, you know, uh, pass the microphone to Ruslanus, and perhaps you could comment whether, you know, the it's possible to, um, you know, to uh, combine compliance and KYC processes in a streamlined way, but actually enable businesses open bank accounts much quicker. That's what you're working towards, right? Yeah, thank you for having me here. Uh, so, <coughs> look, <coughs> I'm quite uh, wonder as well uh, why it's not a topic of uh, you all guys to sit in here because uh, um, around the uh, let's say 80% of you are in transactional business, so it's like uh, you're moving funds uh, internationally. So uh, for you, it's compliance, it's like uh, uh, much uh, hot topic. It should be hot topic, but for us, it's even more because we are like, a, we are a true bank. So uh, we've got not only the transactional business, we've got the lending business, actually we are came from the lending business. So uh, for us, just to be not compliant uh, uh, in transactional business, it means that we are putting in risk our core businesses. So for us, it's uh, quite hot topic uh, as well. Uh, of course, we are trying to cooperate with uh, some fintechs uh, in order to provide them our infrastructure, uh, our knowledge and uh, our capacities to to support their businesses, but uh, uh, for us uh, the main the main thing is what is your business idea, let's say. So uh, a lot of fintechs here they are quite in a risky businesses, so they are just uh, uh, taking high risk clients and. Uh, trying to, to, to make businesses there. So uh, business model, so is the key. So what, what you are all about and what is your, what is your business model, you, you try to, uh, to operate in the market and trying to make money because we are all here not like uh, serving so, of course we're uh, serving some social needs for the, for, our, for the Lithuanian market, for international market but we are all about the, the businesses and how we can generate cash streams, not only expenses on our balance sheets. So uh, regarding the uh, regulatory issues and uh, compliance issues, uh, so for us it's, it's, it's uh, as I said, a hot topic because let's say uh, I had a look on uh, regularly on our balance sheet and our HR balance sheet. So what I see there, so actually 70% uh, of our people, they are working to keep the license. So, and only 30% of people, they somehow are frontliners or doing the business. So uh, here is an impact. So 70% of my expenses or expenses of our bank is like about all the compliance and all the keeping the license. It's not about uh, expanding the business, even within the Lithuanian. So here is an issue, of course, but uh, as a true bank, we've got uh, more than, uh, let's say, w one level of such an issue. So we've got the core businesses, we've got lending businesses, we've got some guarantees, we've got transactional business as well. So uh, for us, compliance is more broader than only AML or, you know, client identification and putting them on our balance sheet, so. Well, thank you. I think, uh, of course, fintech is one of the most regulated sectors in economy, and it is, it is fair that there is a certain degree of, you know, compliance that the companies have to, um, to, to sort of to look at. And uh, I think the, the key question here is, what is, the, um, what is the relationship with the regulator and whether, you know, you are able to work effectively and uh, perhaps just, you know, a, a few words in terms of your, what's your experience in actually um, having that sort of compliance uh, as, you, as you actually c continue your business. We'll go in turn. 
Um, we would like to have a more open dialogue with the regulator on the supervisory level, because uh, my experience came from marketing business in Lithuania as a fintech hub, basically, and for the telling companies how good it is to be here. Now I'm on that side where we actually uh, promoted it and, and some investment happened and we have to sustain that. And the experience what we had with the supervisory part of the regulator is um, a completely different picture. And I'm sure there are changes happening over there. Um, I'm sure there are moving forward as well, but what we want to be as a contributor to that change as well, and we want to be talking more openly as well what's happening in the market and how they should react or how they could react and help them do that as well. One of the initiatives that we are participating at, I'm sure we'll be talking about that later as well, is the RegTech, uh, where our mission is to be as open and transparent as possible and take that bureaucracy burden from our side and from the government side as well and see where we can work together so that would be opened and more transparent, basically. So dialogue is a key thing. I think that's what happened on the marketing side of, of the Bank of Lithuania, and I think it's very much the time to be happening on the supervisory level as well. We saw the numbers of the companies that have invested already in Lithuania, so obviously they have to be supervised on some levels, and, and that's compliance. That's innovation, and that's where we want to be at the front of the agenda as well. Mm, my experience is maybe different. I tend to disagree, sorry. Um, in terms of relationship with the Bank of Lithuania, I'm, I'm CEO of a Lithuanian sum of entity, but I'm also heavily involved in the company's expansion globally, so I work with many regulators and can compare the level of communication we get here, even with supervision and the level of communication I get in other countries. So it's a night and day experience, I would say. Even these kind of minor things like ML trainings that you can watch online, uh, if you tell this in other geographies, people get shocked. And if you explain to them that this training is, by the way, in English, uh, they just do not get it. Uh, so. I definitely would not define our regulator and relationship with the regulator as conservative. Uh, areas for improvement, definitely. There are always areas for improvement, and I'm very, really glad to hear that there are companies that really volunteer to participate in this RegTech initiative. It definitely can, can do even better. Uh, but I, but wh well, while comparing, even with European Union, I would still say that uh, it's, it's a good place to be, and we're glad to be here. That's what we like to hear. <laughs> well, um, <coughs> I want to congratulate the uh, authorities here on, on the achievements. And uh, this is exactly also the reason why we set our company down here. We looked at several places, the UK, Luxembourg, Malta, Croatia, Portugal, and uh, this was the only uh, authorities that said, okay, how can we help you? The, all, all the other authorities, they said, ah, another troublemaker. What, are you, what do you want? You know. So here's a completely different uh, atmosphere and um, uh, kind of uh, solution-minded and business-minded. And I think that's a key. And I hope that this will also be for the next steps uh, in the, if the, we're setting up a center of excellence here for risk management, that this will be uh, kind of a solution-minded and business-minded because Currently with the AML, uh, I mean, I agree, but we have to fight the, co the, the, the fight uh, uh, to uh, money laundering. But uh, currently we're trying, to, we're trying to kill a fly with a nuclear bomb. I think there are more smarter ways to do this. And I think that we should be solution-minded here and business-minded, not killing all the business with additional compliance burden. Thanks. Uh, I just a uh, short reflection that, uh, in my view, uh, risk management, uh, it's not about business. So it's, you know, but, uh, okay. Uh, we are in good talks with the regulator. We're always open, uh, and they uh, always uh, find time to, to meet us. Uh, since, uh, as I mentioned, so uh, AML and compliance uh, issue 
uh, on this level as the many of fintechs are sitting here uh, are talking about so it's it's only part of our businesses and uh, for me it's like uh, we still got place to improve to uh, develop uh, new models uh, of true banking I, I mean so what what is a bank for me bank for me it's like a transformation of uh, maturities and uh, amounts and uh, uh, taking the uh, liquidity from unprofessional market participants and to, uh, redistribute these opportunities to the businesses, to the other private individuals. Uh, so uh, since our uh, Lithuanian market in Baltic states and even Europe, uh, so we've got a, a highly concentrated banking market. It means that uh, we've got some mainstream banks. They, uh, they've got their home, uh, as they name they home markets and they act defensively so they just keep this house uh, closed and uh, that's it so uh, fintech is acting in a different way they are like uh, they are acting offensive so they are trying to to cross the borders and to make businesses within the entire europe and the world uh, and uh, in in, uh, in such a terms so we've got not so uh, not not a lot of uh, experience let's say uh, from the regulatory side as well because you know uh, no business models were developed uh, here uh, what what now uh, fintechs are talking about let's say uh, cross border lending cross border depositing or taking the deposit cross border so taking uh, the liquidity within the one geographical market and uh, redistribute uh, lending to another uh, market. Even doing this in from Lithuania, taking deposits from uh, German and uh, le and start lending uh, in Bulgaria. So here you can find the maximum uh, value added to your services. But here again, so if we have all the right competences and the experience in place, even within the uh, uh, regulatory cabinets, because uh, there is no ex such an experience. Uh, we've got no such experience 20 years. So, and then when we come to the regulator and say, okay, we try to cross board our activities to another markets. So here is their, uh, our business model, how, when, how we can go further. So, and it takes time, you know, because this is a new business models and all you guys here got a lot of business models that our regulator they haven't seen yet they are not tested yet so here is an issue and here i think that uh, together uh, with the regulator we can uh, develop and explore this financial world uh, within the next one two or three years uh, but in general if uh, just to reflect uh, how you are doing with the regulator so for us it's like open dialogue so it's not uh, only an issue of uh, AML or issue of compliance within the transactional business it's mm. about developing and exploring new models of of doing uh, financial business and doing banking all around the Europe at least well that's uh, that's really great to hear that I mean you know despite the obvious um, demand to be regulatory compliant, uh, you know, the, there is the dialogue with the Lithuanian bank in Lithuania and it seems that it is a constructive dialogue. Um, and uh, it does look like, you know, the, it, it is open in terms of developing new business models as well. So I'd like to probably move on to another challenge that was, that's remained in the top three for the two consecutive years. Um, and uh, that was product and IT development. Uh, and uh, I think it's also closely related to the talent and the skills that we, uh, that we have. And uh, perhaps it's, uh, it's sort of a related question that I want to ask in terms of your teams and when you are recruiting, do you see, what, what is your sort of uh, vision for, for the team and how do you select people to ensure that your company continues to grow and continues to develop your products? Perhaps with Agni as well, because I know that you're heavily involved in that. Uh, yeah, one of my roles is put the team together and, and organize so the work is done. Um, are we talking about tech team only? Yes. Or? Okay. Um, 
I think our reflection is like the talent attracts talent. So as a selling point or how we put the tech team together is like we have a really ambitious and really great CTO within the team who has a vision of how the product should be developed and he shares democratically with, with the team. And I think that's how it's escalated. So we didn't, well, obviously IT and tech is very different kind of people and, and, and very different, difficult people to attract usually. Um, but we didn't have that many issues so far. Uh, also, partly of our, because we, we operate on that level that all our creativity and heads are here and they create the sort of uh, the product and then they have the extension in India, which is part of our investors team as well. So we have a really large capacity to innovate and try and test and, and do different products. So probably that's a bit different situation what, from other companies as well. Um, I may be not the right person to comment on the tech team. We, my tech team is in, in, in another jurisdiction in, in Europe, uh, but from overall hiring perspective here in Lithuania, we have a fastest growing sum up office uh, globally, <laughs> not maybe the biggest in numbers, but, but in percentage wise, the fastest one. We, we didn't face any bigger issues as well. I guess it very much depends from the stat strategy. I, uh, 100% now agree that talent attracts talent. And as we say, we hire good people. So in other words, if we find the right fit for the team, we, 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 we take that person, we, we, everything is learnable. I guess in FinTech, what you knew yesterday, it's maybe not something that it's enough to know today. It's just changing so quickly. So I guess it's more about uh, attitude, about willingness to learn, eager to learn these kind of things. Um, so, so yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't describe our experience here in Lithuania as negative, but we haven't found, uh, searched for tech people yet, so. Johannes? Yeah, well, uh, we are quite happy with the talent uh, available here. Uh, we're a highly technology-focused uh, company, um, and uh, we, um, we use stock options to uh, attract and retain people, so, and also to align uh, the goals, so that everybody is working towards the same goals. Um, but it's, uh, we are a payment card acquirer, and it's quite a specific uh, area, and uh, it's difficult, not only here, everywhere, to find people that know payment card acquiring. And uh, it's not taught in any university, so uh, if uh, the universities here could uh, start a course on payment card acquiring, I would... Uh, I think I would, uh, that would be very good. Uh, I, I could participate in giving some knowledge in that, so, uh, but otherwise uh, we're quite happy with talent here. Yeah, and I think one of the uh, Invest Lithuania remits is to actually feedback to the universities in terms of what kind of specialists uh, the companies need uh, and sort of help develop the pipeline or the future talent. Uh, I would like to jump on to the opportunities that uh, the survey participants have identified as the key ones that they see in 2020. So just to remind you, the, the five opportunities were open banking, instant payments, personal finance, digital currencies, and rec tech. So uh, let's start with open banking, which has the potential to reshape competitive landscape and, and consumer experience. Uh, what are your thoughts and perhaps specific uh, opportunities that your company foresees with the Open Banking Initiative? And we can start with Ruslan. Thanks. Uh, regarding Open Banking, uh, my view on the market and what's happening here, let's say main trends, it's like uh, we've got mainstream, uh, main street banks and we've got the rest of the world. So open banking has nothing to do with the interest of mainstream banks because they've got all the customers in Lithuania or within the other, co uh, other country. So why they need open banking? So no interest to have open banking because I, as I said, they, they play defensive game. Yeah. The rest of the world, it's like uh, access to the uh, whole entire market and uh, here is the highest interest just to go there. Uh, in terms of technical stuff, so 
the idea is quite great idea. It's like uh, actually will support the uh, uh, the development of the fintech and financial markets. But uh, here again, so we've got Berlin Group, and we've got some other groups. So we've got now uh, we've got no a single standard of open banking or connecting your ecosystem to the bank's ecosystem. So here we've got the quite clear issue how to go there. So uh, uh, let's say in order you are fintech and you are planning the uh, extensive expansion within the entire Europe, how you will do so? You, you will create the uh, uh, single solution for single single market, so it's not about fintech. So it's about just uh, trying to connect to the infrastructure of main street banks and trying to use it at least. So here a lot of things that should be done in in the near future, and the uh, the rules of this game should be very cl clarified just to just to make open banking. Uh, come true in a very short period because then it could be uh, let's say we've got open banking in in 10 or 15 years only so here is about investments of course i understand the main street banks because uh, why they should uh, do this additional expenses they've got everything they've got all the clients uh, in the world so why they should open the uh, their system but of course, because of the regulation, so it's not a lot of technical stuff. We've got all uh, requirement to to get these two open APIs, and uh, so theoret theoretically we can connect to the system. But in practically, uh, when you are just dealing with this, such an issues, everyone in this place knows what it means to to their organization to connect to mainstream bank. So. Yes, it's developing, but uh, a lot of things to be done just to make open banking uh, a true story. Thank you. Uh, do you have a comment, Johannes? No. 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 Okay. Um, so moving on to another opportunity of growth that we see uh, FinTechs identified for the 2020 is instant payments. And... Uh, we know that uh, Centralink is gearing up to launch uh, Target 2 system starting from February 2020, which will um, enable access to more than 1,000 banks to use the uh, system and initiate transactions in Euro. Uh, what specific opportunities do you think this opens up for your companies and uh, how that could drive the customer experience as well? Okay, well, we'll be, we've, we've been exploring the opportunities and obviously that's the key thing for our expansion for, for the existing customers and for the new customers. Uh, this is great that is happening. Now we um, saw the major devil in the details. Uh, we know that the requirement, for example, to, tar to, to use Target 2 is you have to have at least 1 million transactions outgoing, not the sum, but the outgoing transactions within the year which we looked at the numbers of last year's 2019 of how many companies that are based in Lithuania who would be applying for that. It's only three. And um, basically considering that you have to be like, your reputation has to be cleared. Those three companies had, fi had been fined already. Um, so we, we don't know how this is going to work and we would suggest to keep on talking how could this be developed because obviously that's very interesting and I'm sure like the majority of the companies would agree with that that is an expansion another game changer on, on the map as was SEPA and with the central link right um, we would have suggestions so obviously the, uh, that could be a commission fee that is equivalent and we know that you have to support the commercial side of central link and obviously there are other ways of doing it than just you know we want to be open to competition and we want to compete on the market on equal basis so that's the details that are there uh, from our perspective, we are still in kind of in process of connecting to Centralink, but definitely that was one of the key factors why we chose Lithuania's jurisdiction to get a, to get a license. 
we are still heavily operating through our banking partner network uh, and, and, and will continue to operate like this, but definitely Centrelink, I mean, again, it's, there are only a couple of countries where fintechs can uh, connect to payment system at central banks. In fact, I personally know only three. So it's a huge advantage of the jurisdiction and especially for uh, smaller players that have issues with, with the banking uh, sector, finding partners, and etc. So as a, an option, uh, I guess it's, it's, it's great that we have it, but I agree, uh, uh, agree with my colleague that uh, definitely it's not a very easy process uh, to connect and also uh, to expand the central link, but by the end of the day, it's not, <laughs> I mean, you are connecting to the central bank payment system, so it shouldn't be that easy. So. I, I, I guess it's, it's, it's a matter of how, how prepared you come. Uh, we have been looking into the central link and uh, <clears throat> I think it's a great initiative. Um, we are evaluating it for ourselves. Uh, there's a challenge. We are dealing, we, we are dealing in 10 currency, European currencies and the central link is only uh, open for euro. So we always have to have a second system. Uh, so that's something that we are just looking into. Here is again one more quite, quite hot topic of uh, doing businesses uh, within uh, next uh, couple of years. Uh, for us, uh, Target 2 is enormous opportunities and uh, definitely we will, we will connect to this system and actually we are starting our integration to Target 2 system. Uh, and uh, I welcome all the you guys here just to uh, uh, explore these uh, opportunities and try to, to do the same. Uh, why? Because we are like in quite an open talks with the regulator. And uh, one month ago we met with the board and uh, so one of the main topic was, hey guys, how we can operate and uh, deliver services to our clients uh, in, in, uh, in the world where we've got the exclusion policy, exclusion from infrastructure. It means that uh, the access to, to the infrastructure right now is, get, is getting more uh, worse. So how we, can, how we can do businesses, how the uh, fintech companies that are uh, decided to operate from Lithuania how we can keep these companies within the our market and then within the our license in such a world where we've got the uh, uh, exclusion from the infrastructure. So could you give uh, us a help just to solve this issue? Because it's an, for us, you know, we are in a lending business and transactional business, but for the guys who are only in transactional business, how they will operate in case they've got only uh, access to SEPA and no other chances to, uh, to create and provide services for, for their customer. So for us, uh, Target 2 is a quite, uh, quite uh, important project and uh, we will go for that. And uh, our, let's say, our ideas to the central bank uh, was if we can cooperate uh, and uh, try to produce in some reasonable time uh, access through the Bank of Lithuania to the whole major currencies in the world. Let's say to create some alternative uh, payment network where the all, uh, all the guys that are operating within the Lithuania can, can join it and, uh, and not asking, uh, 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 let's say, uh, how it was said here, one, two, three, or half a year just to open an Austro or Laura account within the our institution and uh, pay a lot of uh, euros or dollars for, for that account and uh, in three months just to close this account. So this is the, the reality of, uh, of the access to, to main or, or basic payment infrastructure right now. So in case we can organize somehow or uh, help our fintech companies that are residing within the Lithuania to get an easy access to the main 
payment infrastructure within the entire world. So it would be the great job, but it's not only the great job, it, it must job that should be done. Because other way, in case we are just leaving the new companies uh, to compete within the, let's say, in market conditions uh, where the uh, main street banks and the uh, main operators of the payment infrastructure just uh, providing or exaggerating the uh, uh, exclusion politics right now. Of course, because of the AML, KYC, uh, a lot of expenses to, pick you, to keep you all guys with sitting within our Nostra or Laura accounts. So it's all about that. So, okay, I can agree with them. But again, in case we are in fi financial or uh, infant tech businesses and uh, uh, fifty percent of uh, of companies they are just uh, making their businesses within the remittance uh, and and payments so uh, access to infrastructure is is the key i think uh, I think it's an interesting idea i'm not sure if Lithuania, the Bank of Lithuania has uh, plans to 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 develop you know those uh, connections and uh, infrastructure for other currencies, but we'll definitely take it to them uh, i'll Move on to probably last question uh, for the panel before we open uh, to the audience to ask questions. Um, so RegTech one was, was one of the key opportunities that a lot of fintechs uh, foresee uh, for 2020 and beyond, um, of course. Uh, where do you think, uh, what areas of RegTech are most ripe for innovation? Where do you think that innovation should come from? Okay, um, we were one of the three companies that were participating in the sandboxing net right now. Uh, I would invite everyone, I think it's on 24th of February, uh, that the results will be presented of how it happened. So we worked on providing data sets uh, with the vendors who were doing all, all the open data and open bank, uh, not open banking, but the delivering data to the, uh, as a reports, as a form of reports to the Bank of Lithuania. Uh, we think that's going to be saving a lot of hours of our work, really, just compiling the data. And if it can be done in a very transparent way, very automatically, then we are up for that and we want to con be huge contributors to this. Another area probably where this could be applied is, as I said, the supervisory part as well. Um, the, the experience we had, it saved, like, it took hours and hours of data collection and provision to the Bank of Lithuania. So if that could be another step forward as well, where the supervisory automation could be done through that. So that could be a huge saving for the Bank of Lithuania resources and our resources and a way forward. But, uh, sorry, just the experience for that was awesome, really. That's where really the dialogue with the regulator worked and really, really we are pleased with that. Yeah, 100% agree regarding RegTech. Uh, an initiative that it's super cool and uh, reporting is one of the low-hanging fruits. I think we started these discussions like a couple of years ago. I'm glad to see that the results are already coming. It will save a lot of time uh, for all the market participants. But what I want to add, it's very important that we understand this is not something that the Bank of Lithuania should do alone or other governmental institutions. There should be involvement from the market players. We cannot expect that the regulator will deliver everything on the table and, and will just do not contribute. So I'm really glad that we have com companies like Connect Pay that volunteered because, again, it's investment, it's time, uh, but if we want to kind of see this environment functioning efficient, we also, everyone needs to contribute. Well, I think uh, of, of all these uh, opportunities that were mentioned, I think uh, RecTech is the, uh, from my, our point of view, is the main one. Um, I believe that there's, uh, there's uh, opportunities in uh, disrupting AML compliance with RegTech. Uh, so uh, we are, for example, setting together a system where we can uh, onboard a new uh, customer uh, within two days and all down to 15 minutes. Uh, but this is done just with uh, systems. and. Uh, we are trying to do this by increasing the quality at the same time. 
but this is something that uh, the market needs, and uh, I think that uh, if uh, the ones that are providing such solutions will be having a, a huge opportunities on the market. Thank you. Yeah. Rectech and uh, reporting, it's like another hurt for, for our company. Uh, I'm and I'm uh, will explain why. So actually, well, again, we are the bank. So the uh, report, we've got the same reporting as Sweet Bank, SEB, or HSBC, or whatever bank in the world, uh, in, 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 in the Europe they've got. So the same reporting, same extensive. So we are in talk with the regulator just to, you know, I've got uh, no such an idea, not mine idea, but I like it that you know always you, you shall put figures, uh, you know, in the right place. So and when you then you can compare and, and make some decisions on it. So put put the figures. So our figures are not such uh, the figures that uh, uh, SCB, Deutsche Bank, or Swedbank get. So that's, uh, that's why we think that uh, such an extensive financial prudential reporting that are applying for fintechs or for the startup banks, so uh, they are not actually, no, uh, we shall actualize the uh, reporting according the business model and the volumes the organization produced. Now we're in talks with the regulator just to somehow to start talks and the real, uh, uh, let's say real actions how how we can uh, together do something and to make uh, an easier uh, and, and make the life more easier to upcoming companies the companies that are coming to, to Lithuania so we just the the first license the first the first small bank uh, the perhaps smallest bank within uh, Europe and uh, but our initiative is like that because it's hurt us. As I mentioned, 70% like of our personnel were working on compliance and on reporting. So then I said, hey guys, when we will produce our businesses? Because if we are not producing the business forms, so uh, tomorrow uh, we have nothing to report. Yeah? That's why our organization shall be more concentrated on doing businesses, but but not like 70% of our time we just report and uh, doing compliance uh, and all this regulatory stuff. Uh, the initiative of uh, RecTech that is coming from the Bank of Lithuania is quite welcoming. Uh, I'm very appreciate this in initiatives, uh, but uh, it's not an, an easy task to, to do this, that, we've, uh, that the Bank of Lithuania can provide the uh, uh, market participant the hub or some IT solutions just to produce uh, reporting in more or less automated way. way. It's like you're, you're using this hub just to uh, intro the data into the system and, uh, and the regulator, they've got the reporting uh, at, at their hands and there is nothing more to do within that report. But again, uh, organizations, uh, they've got uh, different business models uh, and uh, different uh, types of data, uh, different products and all this stuff. So how to put it on uh, into one place? So it's, it's technically, it's, it's an issue, but uh, in some extent, I think that it's quite, uh, we can solve this issue. And I think that uh, Bank of Lithuania is doing well and uh, in case we've got the uh, some kind of uh, automation of uh, prudential reporting tool within the next mm. 12 or 24 months, it will be one w once again it will be a very very welcoming tool to all the uh, companies that are already operating within the Lithuania and that are coming to Lithuania. And hey guys, you can report easily. So forget about it. Just do business within the Lithuania, do, do business cross-board, just concentrate how to attract customer, how to uh, deliver your business model to your clients because it's all about the client. Yeah. And now we are all about the products and all about the reporting. So, so 
in case we've got this help from the regulatory side and from the governmental institutions, let's say one again, once again, so this uh, KYC and uh, remote identification issue. So why each organization should do it separately? In case uh, the guy with the passport, they came to, I don't know, to uh, Bita or to Swedbank or to SAB and once times they show that he is he or she is she and uh, that this person is quite uh, heavily identification in, in uh, got an identification within the uh, one procedure so why other market participants cannot use that so here we can we can talk about this but here is about then we are talking about businesses but not about just how to report what we can cannot produce yeah and when the whole community will be more focused on on doing business than on doing reporting or how to comply to to the issues so we've got here enormous uh, enormous uh, volumes of operations new business models and all about the businesses and all about the value creation to our customers creation of new uh, new jobs here in, in Lithuania and just to expand in our uh, fintech initiatives w within the entire Europe. Yeah. Thanks. I just want to add, because Ruslan has reminded me, one of the disruptors of the market, well, not the market, but in Vilnius, what we did, the open data initiatives, what, where we opened the data of the municipal companies and the rest of the data that we collected, that actually led to a lot of innovation in regulation in some ways and some other like innovative tools creation where as a municipality we didn't have to invest heavily a lot mm. of anything basically it's just opening the data and allowing it to be used obviously there's gdprs and everything involved but i'm sure like if one of the opportunities of 2020 is the opening the data and making some use of it yeah so i think uh probably just to wrap up uh it seems that uh RegTech uh, success depends on, on collaboration between the companies that come with uh, RegTech solutions and propositions and of course the openness and uh, willingness Sorry. with it. Why, why we are not putting this, uh, the uh, rails <laughs> next to existing rails? Because it's inefficient, yes? Because this is the main infrastructure. W one more tube, one more gas tube to the existing gas tube. Here is again in case the customer is identified by someone else. So why we can't use this, uh, this operation? Because it's, uh, in anyhow, it's an efficient way just to, just to do business. So here we're here in the financial sector. Yeah, absolutely. There's, there's the need for more cooperation. And I think, you know, we have really good foundations and the openness and the willingness for the central bank to actually have those discussions with companies that come in with their solutions. And of course, it's not about only central bank. Uh, it's, uh, it's about uh, regulation as well. It's about governmental. It's about uh, laws we've got in place. So. Absolutely agree. Let's thank our panel today. <laughs> and I'd like to thank you all who participated in the survey, who came today, who spoke at the panel and uh, made the presentations. Uh, please, if you haven't done that yet, download the FinTech Landscape Report that's uh, available on the cards and the slide here. Thank you and have a great day. Ruslan, I'm going to show you how to do it. Ruslan, I'm going to show you how to do it.